Praise the Lord. God is good. Today I want to talk about something that's going to be probably the most difficult message you'll ever hear. I want to just share a thought with you. I'll share my thought I shared at the end. I'll share at the beginning. The book of James, I love the book of James because the book of James is like me in this regard. What you see is what you get. He speaks it plain. There's no ambiguity. The book of James is just, he just says it the way it is. A lot of people want to cut it out of their Bible because it speaks to us. This passage in James chapter 4 is talking to Christian Jews, Jews of the, of the uh, uh, dispersion. They were sent all over the world. They were Christians, but then they were sent all over the world. But all of a sudden, James, the Holy Spirit, let them see and see, these guys aren't doing so good. The world has infiltrated them. Here they accepted Christ, but instead of affecting the world for good, for God, the world has negatively impacted them. And James is like, whoa, guys. Guys, the same happens today. We should be affecting the world, but instead the world affects the church. The church becomes more like looking like the world instead of the world looking more like the church. And that's always been a problem down through the ages, and it's the problem today. And many churches are falling prey to that because they don't want to step on anybody's toes. They don't want to speak. Because this is a hard message to hear. It's God's word, but it's a message that needs to be preached. I'm going to use this as an example. There was a guy by the name of Brother Bill Vaughan. He's since passed away. It was a good friend of, the, of, of my wife's family, and I, I knew him also. And I used to attend some of his tent revivals or services. And he, he was from uh, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Oklahoma City. He was Tulsa, but he was good friends with Oral Roberts and uh, Oral Roberts, uh, Richard Roberts and um, um, T.L. T. Osborne, kind of all those min ministries that were birthed out of, in that area of, of Tulsa going back, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Anyways, when Brother Vaughan was a uh, nicest man, he was a big man. He had a he be he had a good Barry White voice. I mean, he was a baritone or bass. I mean, he he had a but he was a very sweet man, and he was just big. I mean, he was a big guy, not 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 heavy, but just big, big boned. And when you talk to him, he was the sweetest man as you'll ever meet. Couldn't be a nicer man. But when he got in the pulpit, wow. I actually, one time, I think I, I could have just been my own, so I saw his eyes go, Pshew! everybody's hair got burned back to the 10th row. It was as if God was speaking to you. I mean, he was boom, boom, boom. It was as if you were standing before the throne of God. You felt like Isaiah, woe am I, a man of unclean lips. And it was good. I mean, it was powerful, but it was, it was hard, hard, hard. And he was the nicest man in the world. And I'll never forget him one time saying, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, why do you have me preach like this? Why can't you give me Oral Roberts' message where expect a miracle, you know, but only believe God's got a great day for you. You know, God's got a miracle waiting for you. And, you know, the, the, the encouraging kind of stuff, the easier stuff to preach that gets an amen and gets a handshake, or not a handshake, gets a, yeah, go ahead with your bad self now. You know, why can't you give me that kind of message? My message is hard, like James. He said, Bill, oral catches the fish, but you clean them up. Somebody has to clean the fish because if they don't, fish will go bad. You catch fish, if you don't clean them, they go bad. Same thing happens in Christendom. Somebody has to clean the fish. And he said, so therefore, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll preach the way you want me to preach and say what you want me to say. And his message was always calling people back to God. If you read all through the scriptures, isn't that what it's always about? James will be like an Old Testament. If James could be classified, he would be an Old Testament prophet in a New Testament time. He was like, James is always saying, guys, come on. You're letting the world affect you. We talked last week about it. You're letting worldliness Affect your walk with God. And, you, you know, you, you're actually, and what's going to happen to the next generation and so on. So let's read uh, uh, James chapter 4, verse 10. Or not verse 10, 1 through 10. Let's read that. And just, I mean, he's writing to Christians. This is still a good word today because he was writing to the Jewish Christians. And he's, this is writing to you and I as Christians today, living in a sin, because we're all over the world, and we should be. But he's saying, guys, you need to affect the world, not have the world affect you. Before we read it, now, one other thing I was thinking, I go to... Uh, I speak to a lot of students. I could go to Valley Forge to be a min or in the ministerial uh, uh, classes and so on, and, and whether it peds some, another, another uh, ministry for the Assemblies of God. And one of the things I, I find out that's happening in, in, with our young adults that are going to ministry, I'm finding out, and this is sad, 
I met with two just a, a week or two ago. And it's not a matter of what can I do to please God. It's how much can I do this, can I still do this, this and still be a preacher? Can I be a pastor and still do this or do this? Can I be a follower of God and still do this? I instantly say, if you're asking that question, you shouldn't even be in, in the ministerial program. Your life should be, what can I do to please God? What can I do? I need to die and he needs to increase. Instead of, I need to increase and he needs to just stay with the same. That's happening so often in America today among our young people, but it's happening among our older folks. They're getting tired. Well, you know, maybe we need to lighten the standard. We need to, we need to lighten it. No, James says, don't do that. You're, you're, you're like this group that I have to speak to. And I, I speak to them all the time and say, guys, no, you need to ratchet up your desire to please God, not cower down. It's kind of like I'm going to use alcohol as an example. It drives me crazy. No one likes the King James Bible, especially when you're talking about elders and deacons. The Bible clearly says if you're a pastor, you should touch no alcohol. Zero. An elder should be a drinker of no wine, the Bible says. It's King James. Drinker of no wine. But it says about a deacon, could be a drinker of a little wine for the stomach's sake. But an elder, which is a bishop, overseer, pastor, should be a drinker of no wine. Now, I know the ones will say, well, this translation says that. I don't care what that translation says. They've all taken it and tried to white it out so they can make it. Everybody can have alcohol. No, 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 no. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Remember the Nazarite vows. There were certain things that they had to take. Hair couldn't be cut, couldn't be drink this, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. The same thing goes for a pastor, overseer, bishop. They're held accountable to a higher standard. And they should be a drinker of no wine. I don't care if it's a toast at a wedding. I don't care what it is. They should not have any alcohol, zero. But yet today, oh, uh, it's okay. No, it isn't okay. It's okay to you, but it's not to God. It talks about a deacon, drinker of not much wine. And that, so, therefore, those are the things that are happening. Well, yeah, you, we, can, we can gamble. We can have raffles in the church. I'll stop with that. We're allowing the things of the world. The Bible, you know how the Bible raises, how Jesus raises money? It's called tithes and offerings. You and I are called every week. He says, bring a tenth to the storehouse. We're called to give an offering. Is what God calls us to do. It's not, well, if you have a raffle and they can give, that's American way. That's what we want to do. We want to get back because we think it's our money. God says, no, no, I've blessed you with all that money that you have is yours. Or I blessed you with, it's mine. I'm only asking you for 10% back. The government asked you for 40%. And realize, and God says, I'll bless you if you give to the storehouse. God's way of making money is not car washes. There's nothing wrong with a car wash. There's nothing wrong with a hoagie sale. That's, that's what the world says. That's what the world does. God says offerings. Remember in the Old Testament, they brought such offerings in, they couldn't contain it all. There was more than they needed. That's God's design. Man does it another way. God says offerings and tithes and offerings. If, and if we know the statistics have been done. If every, every Christian paid their tithes, oh, the church would have more money to do the things God asked them than ever. They would never ever ask for an offering. They could give it back in many ways. Because anyways, what I'm just saying, what's happened, the world has affected the church instead of the church affecting the world. Let's read this here, James chapter 4. Worldly institutions should do it the worldly way, but godly institutions should do it God's way. What causes war? James asking the, the, the Christians here. He's talking to Christians like we're talking this morning. I'm talking to Christians here. What causes wars and what causes fightings among you? Is it not your passions that are at war at your members? That word passions there, is it not your desires, your wants, your self-gratification? Is it not your ego? Is it not your pride? Is it not you want it your way, your passions that are at war in your members? And that members is both here and also in here. There's a war in us. We want things our way, James is saying. Does that, is that, he's saying, is that part of this whole wars and conflicts? Okay, number two, sorry, sorry, Corey. You desire and do not have. So you kill and you covet and you cannot obtain. So you fight and you wage war. You do, you do not have because you do not ask. Verse three, here's the thing, to, I want you to see this. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. We'll come back to this. To spend it on your passions. He answers the question here. Look what he calls Christians here. He's calling these Christian Jews. And you and I as Christians. He's calling you and I are unfaithful creatures. Unfaithful creatures. 
Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? The world was affecting the church. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Hoo-hoo. That's tough stuff. Or do you suppose it is in vain that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit which he has made to dwell in us? Stop there for a minute. This is a picture I want you to see. When you came to Christ, when I came, when those Jews came to Christ, we came to Christ, God placed his spirit within them. He placed his spirit within you. And then when we take that spirit to places where we shouldn't, at a bar somewhere drinking, knocking things back, when we go to a, a house of ill repute, or when we do something crooked, or, or we go someplace to hang with people we shouldn't hang with, or they're, they're bad influence on us, or whatever. It says God is jealous, because he, he doesn't pull his spirit back from you, but he's jealous, and oh man, he's taking my spirit in places he should not go. He's doing things that he should not be doing. He's looking at things, he's, and my spirit is watching that and seeing that. Shouldn't do that. God is jealous, he yearns over that. He placed within you a pure spirit that wants you to walk in purity before him, but instead, but instead you're taking him in places where he should not go, and things he should not see, though he sees it, don't get me wrong, but you're taking him there, and you're willfully entering into that sin. Verse 6. But he gives more grace. Thank God for that grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud. The premise is, we're arrogant and proud. We want it our way. God loves me. He gives grace. I can do whatever I want. God opposes that look, the proud, but he gives grace to who? The humble. Submit, therefore, here it is. Now, James would be a military sergeant right now. He's changed to a military sergeant. I should say a drill sergeant. If you're in the military, this is what he would say. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Here's your problem. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and then he will flee from you. In other words, you're in the world. You've got to stop this messing around with the world. Just submit yourself to God. That's the answer. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God. You're not drawing near to God. You're doing what I said about those kids in Bible school. Well, what can we still do and be a Christian or a pastor? Stop that thinking. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. In other words, it's not God. The Spirit of God in you is not keeping uh, his promise slack. He wants to do with you and for you, but he's saying, you've got to draw near to me. Cleanse your hands. This is a military, this is a military three verses here. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. He's talking to the church. He's not talking to this, what we call sinners. We're sinners. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Dan Miller, put your name in there. Put Dan Miller in there. And purify your hearts, you men of double mind. <clears throat> Here's the great picture of repentance. Here's the saddest picture of America today. In America, we have everything for the most part. I mean, I know we're struggling with some things, but we, we're still a pretty fortunate country in many ways. The difference, when people, I ought to say when I was younger, when people would come to Christ and get saved, they would mourn. They would weep. They would almost howl. They would throw their sins on the altar sometimes. Some of the, uh, I would say some of the things that caused them to sin. They would throw them on the altar. There was a, a repudiation. You knew you did something wrong against God, and you, did, you didn't want to continue that behavior. Whatever that behavior was, whatever that sin was or sins were, you were ashamed, but at the same time you wanted it out there, gone. Because you, 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 you hated that you hurt God this way. You hurt your maker this way. This is a picture of repentance here. Be wretched. In other words, oh, be in turmoil. I can't believe I did this to God. I can't believe I treated his creation that way. I yelled at the lady he gave me. The woman he created, the man, the neighbor, whatever. I can't believe I did that. And mourn. This would be a picture of put on sackcloth and ashes. And weep for your sins, for my sins. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. Don't let, today, when people get saved, I just give my heart to Christ. He loves me, and I can go on my merry old way. Isn't this wonderful? Stop. I'm not sure that's salvation at all. I'm not going to judge it. I'm not sure it's salvation at all. We're selling a bill of goods even in the church that's not biblical. There needs to be a wretched position. There needs to be a mourning for my sin. Oh, God, why did I waste 30 years? I'm sorry, God, for my sin. I'm just sorry that I cursed your name. I'm sorry that I did this to your daughter, your kid, your neighbor. Well, I'm sorry I did this, God. I, I, I know I'm, 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 I'm a failed human being, but I'm sorry. And you mourn and you weep instead of having laughter. Turn it to mourning and your joy to dejection. You're saying, God, I don't deserve 
anything from you because I'm a wretch sinner. That's the posture. Isaiah, he's writing the scripture. Isaiah, a great man of God, but all of a sudden, the closer he got to God, what happened? He put his head down. He got before the Lord, and he said, woe am I, a man of un... He's writing the scripture in the sixth chapter. Finally, he says, he has this great vision. He's taken up to God, and all of a sudden, see, the closer you get to God, the more worthy you won't feel, the less worthy you'll feel. And see, in our society, oh, the closer you get to God, the happier you'll feel. Not necessarily, your, your life will be one thing, but you'll feel, I don't deserve anything. God, you've blessed me. I'm a nobody. You see, we have to get to be a nobody so he can become everything in our life. Understand that. And so he can become the somebody. And let's go back to nine a second here, just, just for a second, to verse nine. And your joy to the dejection. We need to have, that's missing today in the American church. I'm generalized. I know there's some that probably have it. But overall, it's like, come to Jesus. Everything will be fine. And you just have to pray this prayer and sign, sign the card. That's not what the scripture says at all. The scripture doesn't even make anybody walk down the aisle. The scripture talks about you'll be wretched. You'll mourn. You'll weep for your sin. You'll be sorry for what you've done. And you, and you, you won't laugh about it. You'll say, oh, God, Lord, if you can, like Isaiah said, he's down here, and he says, what a wretched man that I am. Oh, cleanse my lips. Send, you know, send an angel from the, uh, take off the altar, a cool and cleanse my lips. But then the Lord says, who will go for me? But Isaiah, in that posture of mourning, that posture of feeling wretched, feeling unworthy, said, Lord, his head's down, but his hands, if you can send me, I'll go. And the Lord says, that's the posture I want you in. Because remember, let's go to verse 10. If you have this, now that he was humbled, Isaiah was humbled before the Lord. You've got to realize he was writing the scripture at this time. Isaiah was a good guy. But yet this, is, this was his posture, verse 9. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Too many people want to exalt themselves. Too many churches want to exalt themselves today. Let God exalt you. God has a plan for your life. God has a plan better than you can have for your life. God has a plan for this church greater than we can have a plan for. But he wants, he wants to exalt you, but too often we want, to, we want to exalt ourselves. And we think we mean well, but we end up doing the opposite. You see, James is saying here, why do you have these wars and fights among yourselves? In yourself and in, in, in your congregation why does it happen he said in verse 1 and verse 2 when you read verse 1 and 2 which we read he answers the question it's your gratifying you gratify yourself what causes this self-gratification you see it's about worldliness the way every Christian here would probably say if I said this would agree to this our main goal in life should be to glorify God to bring glory and honor to God in all that we do and we probably agree to that that's a good thing but instead, what happens is most people, because there's a second power at work that says you should have happiness and pleasure, that should be your chief aim. And then if you glorify God, good. Mm -mm. The first should be I want to glorify God and not gratify my flesh. But too often we want to gratify the flesh, and then if we can, we'll glorify God. You see, there's a subtle change that's taken place. Our desire should always be to gratify God first and, for, first and, for, uh, and foremost. And then, if, then if, it's, if it pleases our flesh, great. James asked those two questions, but he answered his own. The first question was, why do you have these wars and fightings among you? Those two words are interesting in the Greek. The first word, wars, describes a continual in, in your member here and in your members here. There's a continual Hatfield and McCoy kind of thing. There's always a family that wants to control, or two families that want to control, and they butt heads, and they butt heads. There's that continual feuding or hostility. He says, why do you have that? That should never happen in the body of Christ. It shouldn't happen in here or in here. Why do you have that? And then you also see the word, you know, the, the, the word fighting means a flare-up once in a while. It's kind of like anorexia and bulimia. Anorexia is all the time. It's continual. But bulimia is binging. And so every now and then you have where things aren't perfect, but there's this underlying current. All of a sudden there's a flare-up. There's a fight. There's an argument. There's a quarrel. Why do you have the two? Then he asked with the second question. He answered it. Isn't it because of your passions? Because of what you want? Your self-gratification? Instead of glorifying God, you want what you want. This is the way my grandfather did it. This is the way my father did it. So that's therefore this is the way we're going to do it. We're going to do it my way. I want it my way because of ego because of pride, because of, uh, of our own desires. And James is saying, that stinks, guys. God hates that. You know, it, it kind of, it, it reminds me just so often of, you know, people trying to have it their way. In America, though, this has become a problem because what do we have? Where's the Burger King said, have it your way at Burger King. I'm, I'm dating myself. That's an old commercial, very old. 
but that, have it your way. You know, hold the pickles. That was McDonald's, wasn't it? Hold the pickles, hold the, who, which one was that? Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce. Special orders, don't upset us. Is that Burger King too? Okay, well, it's, have it your way again. Special orders, don't upset us. You know, the only thing we ask is that you have it your way, your way, your way, your way, and so on. It's all, always about that. So therefore, we think spiritually it's the same. God, I want it my way. I want you to do it my way. I want you to do it what I think is right. God has said, no, 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 no. You bring glory and honor to me, and I'll take care of your desires. I'll take care of your desires as you delight in my way, because I know how to bless you. Remember I said last week in the obscure scripture that people don't realize about Jesus. The world does it with an lottery. I had talked about it. Everybody wants to win a lottery. At least we say that. Boy, if I win the lottery, you know, you'd buy a new house. You'd bless this person. You'd bless that person. You'd do this. And all those are good. Don't get me wrong. We all want to have, we like to bless people. We, we do because we're givers, and that's a good thing. But 85% of all people who won big lotteries, they did, I was watching a show on TV about this, wish they never would have won the lottery because there's sorrow added to it. There's all kinds of sorrow. Nobody likes them now, or everybody likes them, and they're broke, or they're bankrupt. Jesus said, when I bless you, I add no sorrow to it. His blessing causes you to have peace and joy and happiness because it comes from a right motivation and it gives you what you need, not what you want. It causes you to end up on your feet in the way you're supposed to be, not what you think you need or what you think will help you and so on. And so often in America, we're sold this bill of goods. You need to do it this way and that way. And these wars, these come up because, these fighting because there's families Oh, I've been a family in this church for so long. I've been a family in this, and we're going to do it this way. Stop it. That should never happen. That should never happen. And that, that causes all kinds of bad problems. Also, look what it says in verse three, verse 3. We prayed for a gal today, Ezra. I pray God, Lord, perform a miracle for Ezra. Man, I want to see that girl healed as much as anybody. And I know their parents want them even more than I do. But look what James says here. This is hard medicine. You ask and you don't receive. Have you ever, don't raise your hand. I, I'd be the first to raise my hand. Have you ever asked and not received? Yeah. What did he say? Because you ask wrongly. Oh, that means I didn't know what to ask. No, 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 no. That's not what James is saying here. People say, well, you have to know what you're asking. It's not what he's saying here at all. He explains it. To spend it on your passions. You want what you want for your reason. You don't want it just for the glory of God. You want it so you can look good, you can sound good, people will sing your praise, and you can spend it on your passions. It's your ego you want to satisfy. It's your, you know, because people say, I'll stop with this, but it's your ego, it's your passion, it's your desire you do it for. You do it for a wrong motive, not because you didn't know what to pray for. Oh, you knew what to pray for, but your motivation for praying was wrong. It was wrong, and because it was about fulfilling your passion, your desire. What Jesus said in the garden, nevertheless, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Do it in your way for your glory and for your honor, nothing that I can claim. It affects, this kind of warring among us affects the effectiveness of prayer. Hear me, I want to set us up for this. I believe after the preaching of the word, there should be signs and wonders. The Bible says signs and wonders will accompany the preaching of the word. I know this in my life. When a wonder happened or a sign happened, people believed. You didn't have to give a sinner's prayer or a sinner's call. They accepted Christ there. I said it last week. I'll never forget. It was probably one of the biggest things that happened when God spoke to my heart and said, tell that lady she's like Hannah. She's pregnant. 30 or 35 young adults at a ball game, all they could talk about was, God must be alive. Pastor Dan didn't know that. How would he know that? He didn't know that. God must speak today. He must care for people. It's the first miracle that many people saw. A miracle changes everything. It causes you to think, could there be a God? Could he even care about me? Does he care about little Ezra? Or whatever the case may be, put your own self in there. It allows you to know that God is alive and well. I could write a book on miracles. I don't understand it all. But I know miracles causes people to know that there is a God. And he's alive. When Jesus rose from the dead, I guarantee everybody there knew. Think about the guy who, killed, who, who ran the spear in his side. The soldier. The Roman soldier. When Jesus hung his head and said, It is finished! Done! Over into your, my, your hands, I commit my spirit. And 
an earthquake happened. The veil was rent. There was no earthquake and the ground shook. What did that, what did that soldier say? Truly, truly, he was who he says he was. He was the son of God. A miracle changed his mind just like that. Many people that day, I guarantee you, fell on their faces and said, we're sorry. You were the son of God, and you are the son of God. An empty tomb three days later convinced even the Christians that he's alive. Convinced even those who thought he was dead, those who were gone to mourn his death, they found out he's alive. Why do you search for the living among the dead? Or, yeah, the living among the dead. You see, that miracle changed everything. A miracle changed signs and wonders. And I'll never forget that. I'm, I'm, I had a few of those experiences. A lady on an airplane, and she said, what just happened to me? I said, you can't deny it, ma'am. God sent me here just to speak to you. Today, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. A lawyer, she's studying to be a lawyer in New York City. I said, you can't deny it. She said, I, I can't. I said, in your quiet time, God has a plan for you. He sent me all the way here just to see you. And those are the things that change people's lives. And you see, we need that in our lives so that many people will believe on him. And cause things that will make them go, hmm. Because without that, they say, and today in America, that's just a book you read. That's just hocus pocus dominosis. Does God really heal today? Is God really alive? Is there a God even? That's just your subconscious at work. That's just your thoughts. You got lucky on that one. That's just a phenomenon of nature that happens once in a while or whatever. And they, and they, they tw- and be, oh, no, a bona fide miracle when doctors say that doesn't happen. You got a miracle. That changes heads and hearts and the way we treat one another, and so on and so forth. To satisfy, it, it, understand, it, it, affects, it affects our prayer. You see, we have evil intents when we pray many times. Evil motives, those evil motives are self-gratification. We should not satisfy self in any way, shape, or form. Desire to. God takes care of that. What does God say? If you have this, I'll see that my seed is never begging for bread. God, I believe God. God says, if you do what I ask you to do, you'll never be begging for bread. He says, God says, I own a cattle on a thousand hills, and I'll bless you with this. If you do the tithes and offerings like I ask, I'll give you back 30, 60, 90 fold. But people go, I want to see the 30, 60, 90, then I'll bless you. Oh, he says, no. Remember, draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh to you. God knows he's not a liar. I'm a liar. He knows God, I'm the sinner, I'm the unfaithful creature. God's not. And he keeps his word, he keeps his promises. And that's where James is saying here, guys, if you want to see the miraculous, if you want to see you're dispersed all over the world, you want to see his kingdom come and not affect you negatively, you need to heed his word. Live his light, live his word in your life, and you'll see great things happen in your life and so on. Our tendency to gratify self, we see in verse 4, 5, and 6, yeah, let's just look at verse 4 and I think about this. I mean, <laughs> this blows my mind. It's a, hard, it's a hard thing to take, but it's the truth. Unfaithful creatures. He's not talking about the sinners in the world. He's talking about you and I. Do you not know that friendship, that you're taking the things of the world and making them, you know, oh, the world does it this way, we should do it that way. No! The world does No! We do it God's way. I can't say... I need to say this, and it's something that God has placed this on my heart. And in my life, I've seen this happen. It says, you have not because you ask not. In all of my life, and I mean this, I'm saying this with all due respect to people who mean well. People mean well by having fundraisers of all kinds. Don't get me wrong. And people mean well. They want to have a fundraiser. If the fundraiser is to have the people have fun together, but it's not about raising money, go for it. If it's because you want to make hoagies, because you, you, know, you like the camaraderie of making hoagies. You like the camaraderie of washing a car. Okay, if that's what you want to do, it's not about the money. It's about having fun together. Good, go for it. If it's, you know, making a chicken dinner for the neighborhood and you charge $10, whether you make any more spaghetti dinner or whatever, nothing wrong with that. If it's the camaraderie you want to have, go for it. But if it's about the money, stop it. God's way is tithes and offerings. You have not because you ask not. Let me just give you, I'm going to say this with all due respect. I don't want anybody to take this wrong. I understand something. In my life, in my life, and I've lived 62 years, after asking for, could be the homeless like Daryl, could be a building project, could be a missionary somewhere, could be a heating system for something, whatever. After service, I've had people put $40,000 checks in my pocket as I'm walking out. 
not for me, but for what I asked for. I've had people, a lot of people with 20,000. I've had people stop by my house and give $50,000 checks. The highest check I've had is $600,000 given to me. You have not because you ask not. God's way is not having spaghetti dinners. There's nothing wrong with a spaghetti dinner. It's asking because God says, bring your tithes and your offerings that my house will be full. If we did that, if the church would do that, we'd have more money for the widows and the orphans than you'd ever need. And I've lived it my life. I've had so many, I've had times where I said, God, I've got to hire that person. I don't have the money. I need 50 grand. Somebody calls three hours later and says, Pastor, are you thinking about hiring somebody? Yep. How much do you need? 50 grand. It's yours. It's in the mail. I've had that happen over and over and over and over in my life. I know what I'm talking about. That's God's way to fund the kingdom. Fundraisers are okay. That's the way the world has infiltrated. Here's what we need. We need to have a calendar every day where we call a number out. And we give $100 away. That's man's way. That's not God's way. You get 1000 bucks, and God says, I could give you $1,000 in a moment's time. But instead, you're going to do it your way, and the results you'll get will be minimal. Where I can move on one person's heart and give you a $50,000 check in a moment. I can move on one person's heart, and they can drop $600,000 into your wallet. Not for you, but for that which you ask. Missions work or whatever it may be. That's God's design. We're allowing the world, he says, we're unfaithful creatures doing it our way. Do you not know that friendship, don't be friends of the world. Don't become an enemy of mine. I want to bless you. You're my kids and so on. I want to bless you, but do it my way. It's important that the proud, he says, those who are arrogant, they, they defy God's uh, 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 and refuse to admit his sovereignty over the world. God is sovereign over the world and over my life. Let me, I mean, I could, man, we were at a service one time. I'll never forget this. We were young. God told me this at a young age. We just had a baby, three months old. Deb and I had $125 to our name. And we had rent of 80, we had rent of $85 a month. That's what that rent was, $85. We had $125 to our name. I was at a service in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And the Lord spoke to me. Deb was in the nursery with Becky, who was three months old. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, Dan, they were taking, they, were, they wanted Bibles for China. And they were taking an offering for, in order to give 100 bucks towards that. And I thought, Lord, that leaves me with $25 to my name. But then I, then I thought, what's 25 bucks? If 25 bucks, 125, I'm not rich. And 25 bucks doesn't make me poor. I'm in the same boat anyhow, either way. So I gave, and I thought, well, Deb's going to kill me. But I went back and said, Deb, I hope you don't, aren't mad, but I know you weren't here. You were in a nursery, but I gave 100 bucks tonight. She said, if God spoke that to you, I'm glad you did because that would be the best 100 bucks we spent. <laughs> Let me tell you what happened. <sighs> Deb was pregnant with a second child. We had no insurance either. <laughs> As it turned out, man, it was the greatest blessing we ever had in our life. God showed me something. Give and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I'll never forget this. The doctor said, I won't charge you a penny. You have no insurance. The doctor didn't charge me a penny. The hospital bill was 500 bucks for four days. They only charged 500 bucks for four days. We got a check in the mail for $5,000 from an anonymous source that said, we, you, we were praying and the word put you in our mind. We got $5,000. And I got a raise at work, a dollar an hour raise too. And a dollar an hour at that time was a lot. I was able to pay off that $500 hospital bill. Doc didn't charge us anything. He said, nope, it's all yours. We remodeled the downstairs of our house with all that money and still had 1000 bucks in the bank. All because I gave $100 to God when he spoke to my heart. That's God's way of expanding the kingdom. It's his blessing pack with you and I, and also it's his way of expanding his kingdom. It's with tithes and offerings. It's not doing other, and yet there's nothing wrong with those fundraisers, but they should not be primary. They should be, we're doing it because we, like, we want to have fun together. You know, kids are doing things together, that's all fine. And Danny, but I've lived my life now, and I'm saying, I guess I'm getting old, I'm not afraid to hold back. Because I've lived long enough to have my pockets where people give, and not for me, if not one penny for me. I want you to understand that. It's for what guy asks for, for a missions work or whatever it may be. You see, God's sovereign over us. He is sovereign over our lives. And whatever God speaks, I'm going to do. 
Whatever God speaks to you, you should do. No matter, oh, well, a hundred, just give it. Unregenerate man requires repentance. That's what he talks about. Let's go to verse 5 here and verse 6 just real quickly here. Verse 5 and 6 here, just put them up there. You know, he yearns. He put his spirit in us. And when we don't listen, it grieves. The Bible says don't grieve the Holy Spirit. That's how we do it, by not giving that 100 bucks, by not putting our arm around that kid and encouraging him, by also causing that war, that quarrel. Well, we're going to do it this way. It's because of your passion. Oh, Lord, would you do this? Let me tell you something. This, I saw this happen. I wouldn't believe it if I wasn't there. Ichabod is written upon that church. It was, it was an assembly of God church. I never felt that God would, I, I want to get out of there. I would have rather been in a bar where they were doing all kinds of terrible things. Because among sinners, you expect sin, but you don't expect it among Christians. Another brother and I were called in. There was a, a quarrel going on in the church, assembly of God church. This side over here was the Millerites, let's say. They weren't. They were a follower of the Miller, Dan Miller. This side over here was a follower of Rick Yanalunas, the Yanalunas clan. I don't know, I'm just saying that. But that's what it was. There was two clans. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. And we were there to try to get this church because it was, it was splitting. It was killing the church. It was killing the church. And we were, another official and myself were called there to, to try to bring some help to the situation. I sat in the platform. We had a service before we were going to talk about the dysfunction that was happening, what James is talking about. And I sat on the platform. We had this service. And I walked out. I said, I'm not going to be a part of this. One person from the Millerites stood up and gave a message in tongues. Okay? And someone from the Millerites interpreted it. But then somebody from the Anna side stood up there and said, and now for the real interpretation. I said, I'm out of here. They're trifling with the Holy Ghost. I want no part of this. God has, the Spirit of God has departed from this building, if he ever was here. This is all fake and phony. It's all nonsense. And I said, I want no part of this. I said, the other official, first name was Scott, you stay here if you want to, but I'm out of here. Because this place is going to get struck by, it should get struck by lightning. And, uh, but it shows how people trifle with the Holy Spirit. They try to do it their way. Because why? They wanted what they the Yanamunases wanted their way, and the Millerites wanted it their way. And it caused quarrel and fighting. And it caused such, it was awful. It was awful. As James says, because your own passions. You think they're nice. You think they're wonderful. I'll stop with this last thing here, and then we'll get to the end, and then we'll pray. There was a lady. I'll never forget this. I was in a small church. It needed every penny it could have. It was Basically broke. The church had $32 to its name, had bills all over, hospitals and oil companies and what have you. And one Saturday night before church, we always prayed on a Saturday night, she came to the prayer meeting and we were doing some things that she didn't like because her passions, but she was a prayer warrior. She, she would appear, when she would pray, you would think she was the most godly person in the world, but yet her heart was as far from God as you could get. But she sounded good. Oh, did she sound good. I'm in there making a copy before our prayer meeting Saturday night, and she walks up to me and says, you know, Pastor Dan, I'm not a poor woman. I acted like I didn't even hear her. I just kept going on. She said, Pastor Dan, you know, I'm not a poor woman. And I looked at her, called her her name, and I said, I heard you the first time. I said, I'm glad you are. God bless you. Have a great night. And I walked in and started praying. Because she wanted me to do something, because she was saying, I'm going to pull my money out if you do what you continue on, what you're doing. Well, here's what's cool. God didn't need her money. That next Sunday, somebody put a $5,000 offering. They haven't had a $5,000 gift in a century, that church. And from there it went on. The church just exploded. Why? Because I didn't cower down. Did we need her money in the flesh? Yes. But in God's economy, absolutely not. We did not need her filthy lucre. It was take your money and you should weep in house, sweetheart, because you're full of wickedness. But yet she'll come out, oh God, oh God, stop it. Put a rag in it. And so on. Filthy, filthy, right, filthy rags is what her righteousness, so to speak, was. I've lived long enough to see honor God in all that you do. His way is the best for your family. I want to set us up here for rev revival is coming to this world and it's coming to our area. And I want to be part of that. And so do you. 
I, it is coming, and he's going to use you. He's gonna, and this sets us up for that. Here's the thing as I bring this to a close. The result of doing all that James talks about here it causes us to, let's see at verse 10. When you, when you, verse 10, what we're called to do after hearing this hard message, it'd be easy to say, Pastor Dan's a blowhard. Pastor Dan, just, he likes to be like Bill Vole and just preach hard. He's an old school guy. He's lived too long. He needs to step down and let some younger guy give this nice grace. We're all under grace and do whatever you want. We can all wear this and do that and go wherever we want. And that's okay. Wrong. You, you can do that. You can reject this. But what I'm speaking to you today is not Dan Miller. It's James. It's Jesus Christ. And it will cause you to rise. If you hear it, if you reject it, you will be as, as that creature, unfaithful creature. But if you hear what James is saying here and do this, all of us say, humble ourselves before the Lord. I will be exalted. You will be exalted. We will be exalted. And the church will experience prosperity all over, meaning that it will do what God wants us to do. Will affect the world. Will affect the culture. Will affect our families. Will affect and so on. Because we want our prayers answered. Verse 3, we, James tied together. You want your prayers answered? This is what you got to do, guys. You want God to move in a powerful way, not just a couple mercy drops here and there. You want a torrent of rain? Then therefore do this. So today, humble ourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you in his place. You know, I, you could reject it and say, it's just me. It's not me. I, I've read the scriptures here over and over. It's God saying, Dan, teach my people the deep truths of my word so I can use you in this great revival. Over my life, I've had many, many prophets come from all over the country and say, there's going to be a mighty revival from Pennsylvania come, and you're part of that. I want to set you up to be part of that. I want to set us, us up to be part of that because I don't want to miss out on what God's doing. Amen? Amen? I know you don't want to miss out in your family, in your area, in your business, in your workplace, in your church. We want to see God do something great, just like we want to see God touch Ezra. We want to see God help minister to every need. And he'll do that if we will line up with what James is saying here. I like how James puts it, just very plain, very blunt. This morning, will I humble myself in the sight of the Lord? Will you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord? Will we all humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord? Instead of saying, that's hocus, but get out of here with that. He's just being hard today. It's just the word of God. Will you take it and hear it? Will you make the changes? Will you weep and howl if you need to? Will you do that? Will you mourn if you need to and say, Father, Remember there was an old chorus, I forget what it's called, Lord, I'm sorry what I've made it. You're not asking for a song, Lord, you're asking for a heart of worship. I'm coming back to a heart of worship. Why? Because it's all about you. It's not about me or you. It's not about what we wanted, our passions, are. it's about him. And I'm coming back to that, Lord, and a song is more than you, what you, you require more than a song. You want my heart. You want my undivided attention. You want me to draw close to you because you'll draw close to me. You want me to treat the Holy Spirit inside of me like the most precious thing in the world. You want me to treat, because then understand something. God is an awesome God. He has great plans for your life here. He wants to prosper and give everybody a hope here in the future. God's desire for you is good. God's desire for us is good. He's a great uh, heavenly father. He's a great high priest. He's not an old ogre. That's t he only says it so that we can receive and look back and say, look what the Lord hath done. That's what God does. This. I, want to, I think I know Mike and I talk about this once in a while, and I, I will end with this. Think about this. I listen to Christian radio, like I hope we all do at times, you know, whatever. We all have our own maybe favorite station or two, but or maybe you go back and forth between a couple. Thank God that we have Christian stations around. There was a day we only had maybe one or none, hardly. And we have three, four, five, six to choose from. And of course, now with satellite, you have many more. But, anyways, I listen to Christian radio, and I love music. However, if there's one thing I could share with musicians, that are people who write the songs, I would say, guys, you need to see a different picture of God. Because almost every song that I hear is the person is moaning. Oh, life is hard. Where are you, God? It's difficult. I'm going to take the bridge. Or, or I'm just, Lord, can you do something for me? And they're moaning. It's like painful to listen to. And finally, God finally shows up, and they, thank God it's a hard walk, but I'll make it. Get out of here. Serving God is the greatest thing you'll ever do. It's a joy to follow Jesus Christ. It's a life of celebration, having the God of the universe be your partner, be your king, be your guide, be your counselor, being your, your healer, your provider. God is a great God. And I want to say, guys, 
Sing a song that glorifies God. Sing a song that says, we're victors. We're not the victim. We're the overcomer. We're not going to be overcome. We're going to grow in him. We're going to have peace in him and joy. I know Michael says sometimes he listens to 50 songs until so he finds one that we want to maybe use because it's so downerish. And I don't realize that's the genre of the day. But God have mercy. Get out of it. I call it music to commit suicide by. <laughs> Knock it off. Our God is a great God. And he, when I rise up in the morning, he says, I, my tender mercies are new for you, Dan. I have a plan for your life that will blow your mind. I mean, if you will follow me, I will cause you to be the head and not the tail. I will cause your seed will never be begging for bread because I'm with you. I'm for you. And I have a great plan for you. That's what we need to sing about. And celebrate the goodness of our God and rejoice together. And take back from the devil what he's stolen instead of the devil always stealing from us. Take back from him and give it to the Lord. So with that in mind, we serve a great God. Is it a hard message? Yeah, to get me on, the cor uh, get me on course. It's kind of like the drill sergeant. Like he's speaking as a sergeant here. When you go to the military, they break you down to build you up. They know they've got to break you that, God, we want to we make you as a man or a woman. We want to remake you. God's the same way. You've been taught this way, this way, and it's, your, it's not your fault or it's, or it's the enemy, but I want to break you from that and show you the right way. I want to show you how to be blessed. I want to show you how to receive. I want to show you how to be a blessing to others. I want to show you not to have sorrow added to the blessing. I want to show you how to be the head and not the tail. I can take you from prison and cause you to be second in command in a moment's time. God can do that for you and I. Today, where are you? I want to ask one more question as we close in prayer. In a few short weeks, I know Joan, Joan is having a, a leading a 9-11, I believe it is, men of God. And that man of God is going to be a great you know, a little, I'll, I'll call it a choir, cantata, I'm not sure what they call it, chorus, whatever you want to call it, of about four songs. And if you didn't sign up yet, there's still time today to sign up, but there's going to be practices starting pretty soon, I know that. And only four practices. It's about being a man of God. It's man of God, man of God, man of God. If you're in this place today before we pray, and I'm already standing, no pressure, don't do just because of pressure, but if you truly... I want to be a man of God in this regard. Stop for a minute. This is what I want you to think about. It's how, how you see if you're a man of God. I don't know how many years you've been saved. If you've been saved 30 years, some of you 40 years, maybe some of you 50, some of you maybe just five weeks, some of you just a month, a year ago. But if you've been saved for any length of time, ask yourself this question. Would the man you've become, would the boy you were be proud of the man you've become? Would the boy you were become proud of the man you've become? When you look at your life as a Christian, have you gotten stronger in the Lord or have you gotten weaker? Were you, were you, you, you aren't a good ambassador for Christ. You're somebody who's a Christian, but you cause quarrels, fights, because of the war in your own members, because your heart hasn't changed. Your head hasn't changed. Where are you? Only you I'm not pointing a finger. I'm going to ask you to evaluate yourself. Are you a stronger Christian today than you were when you started? Do you love God more than when you first started? Are you a better giver than you were? Are you a better lover, so to speak, loving people? Love God and love people as yourself? Are you better at that than you were? Are you somebody who's now become jaded? I'm not going to give anymore because somebody misused it. How are you? Ask yourself that question. Are you a better example today than you were five years ago? Everybody needs to examine themselves because God wants us to be further ahead you see, we have to grow. No, ch no, no parent wants their child to stay four years old all their life. Nobody wants their kid to stay 10 years old all their life. It's a sad scenario. If that happens, there's, there's something physically or, you know, uh, physiologically wrong with them. And that's why God doesn't want us to stay baby Christian at best, if we can even stay that. He wants us to be men of God and women of God. He wants us to be women. He can say, that's my daughter. That's my son. That's an example of a godly man. That's an example of a godly man. And that's a godly church. That's my church I'm proud of. And I put my spirit in it, and they've used him rightly. I haven't had to cry over them in vain for the spirit I've given them. And I even had, even, I even had, to, had to pull that spirit away. So in this place this morning as we close in prayer, if you're a man here in preparation for 9-11, man of God, man of God, if you're wanting to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, like you always have or like you never have and you want to. Maybe you want this to be a new beginning. It could be that. 
It might be a continuation of your walk. Or it could be maybe you're here and you never accepted Christ as Savior. If you haven't today, receive Christ. It's the best thing you ever do. He has a plan for your life that will blow your mind. It's so good. It will blow your mind in a good way. God has great things in mind for you. And so on. So if you've not given your heart to Christ, give it to him today. Ask him to be your Lord and Savior. It's as simple as that. And he'll start a relationship with you. And he'll place that spirit in you that he talked about, that he cries over for those who misuse it. But if you're here and you're a man, you're saying, I want to be a man of God. I really do. More than just coming to church. I want to be a man of God at work. I want to be a man of God in my community, coaching baseball, coaching football, whatever it is, uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, I don't know, uh, whatever you do, art collection. I want to be a man of God. If you're here, I just felt the men today, you could say it for ladies, but if you want to be a man of God, would you stand today before we pray? I'm, I'm, I'm already standing. I want, to be a, I want to be a better man than I was yesterday. I need to be a better man than I was yesterday. And uh, God knows your heart. I mean, I see you're out, and I'm glad to see every man that's, that's standing here. I'm glad to see every man that's standing here. God sees your heart, and I, t- I trust that you're standing for the right motive, for the right reason, and, if, and I believe you are. God is seeing that. And I pray that God, I want to pray for you right now, and I'm praying for myself, too, for all of us. And I ask anybody who's, on, in the, who's seated, you know, seated, seated, <laughs> seated, seated, <laughs> seated, to pray for every man that's standing, whether they be a young man or an older man or somewhere in between. Just direct your focus towards that person that's standing. Because God, do you realize if we all become the men of God he wants to become, there is no stopping this place. There is no stopping what God will do in this community. There is no stopping what God will do in this world, in our, in our local world. So, Father, we come before you now. Lord, James was a, I love James speaking, but it, it's hard. It's hard for all of us to bear sometimes. Because, God, we know you, if we read the Bible all the way down through history, your people were always going away from you, and the prophets were always calling them back. Come back, come back. We're no different today, Lord. We mean well, but then we get off on tangents because of the society we live in. There's no excuses, but our hearts grow cold sometimes, or we just don't believe like we ought. Or all those, there's all kinds of excuses and reasons why we kind of aren't the example that we ought to be. But Father, today, in this moment, after we read, have read James, we agree, Lord, that we want to line up with your word. We want to line up with your principles and your way of life because we know we need to become nothing so you can become everything. And God, as men, we stand before you saying, Lord, we're inadequate. I mean, as Isaiah said, cleanse my lips. Woe am I, a man of unclean lips. We stand before you as men of unclean lips. Today, take a coal, Father. Cleanse our lips. Change our hearts into a heart of flesh that has your word written upon it. Father, we want to be men of God. We want to be men of God to our wives, to our children, to our neighbors. Lord, that will bless and do what it's supposed to do. Lift up all boats. Lift all boats around us. Father, today, do what you need to do in all of our hearts. You're sovereign over the earth, over the church, and over us. We give you the right, Lord. Because, Father, I pray that, in, Lord, in, in, in your name today, something will happen in each man's life and that's standing right now. Something will happen, in myself included, will happen that will cause us to know that you have your eye upon us. That this wasn't just an emotional kick for a minute or two or three, but God, you want me to walk this walk because you have great plans. Lord, we humble ourselves in your sight. And Lord, you exalt as you see see fit, but we humble ourselves to you. And Lord Jesus, let something happen that each man will know they're on the right track and it will cause your way to become perfected in their life. Bless each one I pray, Lord, and every lady I also pray for. I just know you felt impressed men upon my life, but, Lord, also for the ladies. Lord, we want to follow you all the days of our life. And we want to prepare. Lord, we want this place to be a place that people can come in and your signs and your wonders can happen. And a place where people come in sick and walk out whole. They come in in derision, not knowing what to do, knowing exactly what to do. They come in, Lord, in a messed up relationship, going out, Lord, in a, in a peaceful mode, knowing how and what they should or shouldn't do excuse me, shouldn't do. Father, that we would just receive from heaven. Bless each one, I pray. May we have a great day in you. And Lord, may the the sun outside warm our outside, but Lord, may you, the Spirit of God, warm our inside and let us know we're on the right track with you. Thank you for each man. Thank you for each woman here. Meet every need today according to your riches and glory. And may we, may we bring honor and glory to you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone shout it together. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.
God bless you as you go. Greet one another. Enjoy this weather that we've been having. Pray for rain. But enjoy